Um, yeah, so my name is Michi. I started uh, using Cake in 2015, so this was right around when Cake 3 came out. I uh, worked at a small agency and we developed a lot of uh, Cake apps. Um, yeah, and, and over the years I just started tinkering around with the stuff that is in my vendor folder, because sometimes it wasn't working. It was always working. It was always me. Um, but yeah, then I kind of developed an interest, like just making some PRs issues on, on GitHub. And then uh, Mark was kind enough to invite me to the core team back then. Um, yeah, and I contributed there for a while. And yeah, uh, around two years ago, I uh, joined Sentry. And I, there I'm working as an SDK engineer, uh, maintaining our PHP Go SDKs and overlooking the overall SDK development. Cool. Um, so uh, what I want to show you today is um, observability. So what is observability? Um, it's basically giving you application insights about your cake PHP app, right? So um, I mean, most of you are probably familiar with logs, right? Like uh, in, in cake, you have like the, the error log or the debug log or the CLI error log. Um, but there are a few like tools, techniques out there um, that make this process like a lot more fun <laughs> than looking at endless log streams. So um, we will look a little bit into like error reporting. So like in, in, instead of like looking at errors like locally or in your server log files, we look at like how in, in Cake you can like centralize them and send them to any third party service that aggregates it for you. Um, then we will look at tracing. So boiled down, we basically will measure certain things, how long they take and uh, send us to some third party service. Um, and then uh, lastly, we will also look at profiling, but uh, not like xdebug locally, no, like actually how, how you profile like a PHP application or okay, cake PHP application on production and um, like what techniques you can use and what are the benefits of doing so. Cool. Um, so to kick things off, um, first uh, I want to introduce you to OpenTelemetry. Um, so OpenTelemetry <laughs> is an open source standard um, slash software, which you can use to add uh, observability to your applications. So um, at, at its core, it's, it's basically like a defined um, protocol um, and you can use it to transmit traces, uh, metrics, logs, and also errors. Um, and the cool thing is that based on this protocol, they have support for many different programming languages. So this ranges like from Go over Java, PHP, Python, Ruby, like basically everything that exists. Um, and they offer like a bunch of SDKs and APIs you can install into your software um, and then start like collecting these traces. Um, and yeah, let's, let's, let's do that. <laughs> so uh, first of all, we uh, need a cake app for that. I think it's correct project. Let's, um, let's just call it cake fest. Cool. And then let's uh, start the dev server. And then let's see if it works. It does. Cool. Um, it doesn't connect to the database. Um, so let's quickly fix that. Uh, so I'm not sure why it does that. But when I set it to the IP, there we go. Cool. Um, so OpenTelemetry in PHP has like two ways to uh, instrument. Um, they have like zero code, <laughs> air quotes, uh, outer instrumentation. Um, and they have like a manual tracing API. And uh, to kick things off, we will look at the zero code um, instrumentation. Um, to do zero code in PHP, most of the time means you need some extension. <laughs> um, and this is the case today. Um, so. Let's just install it. Um, 
I think you will be familiar with Peckel. So that's like the, the composer of PHP extensions for now. They're cooking up something new. Very exciting. Um, and then we just install the open telemetry extension. Yes, thank you. That will happen a few times today. Still? <laughs> Sorry? I, okay, it's already installed, yeah. Um, good. Then, I mean, I already installed it, but y you would install it like that. <laughs> Um, then you need to enable it in your PHP uh, and then it's working. So now we need some way to um, configure the OpenTelemetry SDK. And um, again, you can do this in code, but um, how we will do it today is basically with some environment variables. So um, when you quickly take a look at this here, it's big enough, right? Okay. Um, so you, you, pass, uh, you just pass in some environment variables um, to enable it. Then how you want to export your traces. So OTLP is the open telemetry protocol. So that's like the defined schema. Um, then they support a bunch of different like protocols. So the default is actually uh, using gRPC uh, and protobuf encoding. Um, but this would require yet another extension, and I don't like extensions. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, today we will use HTTP JSON. Um, and then you also have to define like an OTLP endpoint. Um, so where your uh, telemetry data goes. And uh, what we will use today quickly um, is something called Jaeger. So Jaeger is an open source um, trace viewer um, and you can run it locally with Docker, um, and it makes it kind of easy to, to look at the telemetry. Um, to run Jaeger, uh, you can use Docker, so they have like an all-in-one image. Awesome. And then you can go some to some URL, and that's basically how it looks like. Good. We will send some data in there, and then we also see something there. Cool. Um, now we also need to install a, a few dependencies um, for um, OpenTelemetry. So wh while we do have the extension running, um, we still need some stuff in our application, um, which is the OpenTelemetry SDK, the exporter. Um, then we install the outer instrumentation package for CakePHP. And then we also need some uh, PSR, God, what are HTTP client PSR? Some PSR. <laughs> um, and in, in this case, we can use Guzzle, but you could also use like the Symfony client or um, there are a bunch of others. Cool. Um, no, we don't want that. Cool. So if we did everything right, it should already work. Um, but we have to restart the cake app with all the correct environment variables. Okay, it's not complaining, that's good. So in theory, when we look in here, we see a trace, success. Okay, <laughs> so what you're seeing here is a span. What is a span? A span basically represents a duration of something. Um, in this case, this something is roughly five milli, uh, yeah, round it down four milliseconds. So something in our cake application takes four milliseconds. Um, and again, like this is created by this auto instrumentation package, um, and it also comes with some metadata attached to it. So you can actually see um, where in your code it um, collected the telemetry, like a line number. And then it also collects stuff like your HTTP response code, like which type of request, the HTTP version, and so on and so forth. And it also collects some stuff about the host, right? Like which operating system um, and how you ran the application. 
So all of the stuff um, is useful at like when you aggregate the data together later on. Um, so th that might look a little bit underwhelming <laughs> because there's just one span, and but I agree. But let's uh, quickly look at um, what this thing is actually instrumenting. So um, they have this. So they have this uh, repository, and somewhere in here, there should be the contrib thingy. Let's, yeah. Cool. So the way how this actually works is um, they basically hook into a hook <laughs> in the uh, send extension. So basically, every time when you call a user land function, like something in your application, and Cake obviously is in your render folder, so it's in your application, um, they basically evaluate which uh, function is run on which class, and then you can define which um, classes and functions you want to listen to. And in the case here, they um, hook into invoke action of the controller class. Um, then they get the request, and then they start building the span and attach like some certain metadata to it. Um, and then in the post hook, so basically one uh, after the function has ran, um, they attach a bit more stuff, and then they end the span. Then the span is basically converted into this OTLTP format, and then OpenTelemetry has like certain ways how to um, like send your metadata. So the first thing it goes in is some sort of collector. Um, this can be like collectors you can also host like, like next to your application and this can be helpful if you have like a lot of different applications uh, sending telemetry and instead of all of them going like out to the internet and sending the stuff somewhere uh, you can basically collect it in one place um, and this collector then uh, does like batching um, and sending the data on uh, you can also do like some uh, sensitive data scrubbing there and the cool thing is that if your application sends it like to a sidecar of your PHP application, also like the network round trip time is like much uh, shorter than when you do a full round trip somewhere in the internet. All right, um, yeah, so um, so now we have to span <laughs> and uh, now I quickly want to show you how you could add more spans because uh, one span might not be enough. Um, cool. So um, the way we can do this is, so now we're using the OpenTelemetry SDK we installed previously. Um, and just to give you a, a simple example for now, uh, we just go to the pages controller that is in there, and then we can create a span. So um, these APIs, especially in PHP, when it comes like to performance monitoring or tracing, they are a bit clunky <laughs> um, because, like at a low level, you want to allow like a lot of flexibility of how people instrument the applications. So, I mean, clunky is the wrong word. A little bit verbose, let's say it like that. Um, and like in open telemetry, this also like really depends on um, which programming language you use, right? Like all the SDKs they have, they they, have, they follow like the same principles of how they how they are built, but the APIs differ vastly. So for example, in in Rust, which is uh, like a low-level programming language, um, they have like a ec uh, ecosystem-wide uh, tracing package. So it has nothing to do with open telemetry. Um, it's basically just some interface they agreed on on how to create spans, whatever you do with them later, right? Um, and OpenTelemetry just hooks into that. And what that allows you is that you have like a very concise, very um, to the point API that the whole ecosystem uses. Um, and then you can just hook stuff on top of it. Um, in C Sharp, um, it's even better. Um, like, like Microsoft, they build like their own open, uh, uh, sorry, their own telemetry APIs into the language itself. And again, like, Everyone just uses that, and then different consumers like OpenTelemetry just hook on top of that. Uh, in PHP, there is no such tracing package yet. Um, I think that would definitely be great. Um, 
but yeah, so we, we, we have to work with what is there. Um, so in order to create more spans, um, we have to jump through a, a few different hoops. Um, so first we need our trace provider, um, and this is basically scoped on our application. And as I didn't configure anything, how it's called, so by default it just um, takes probably the composer name, so okay, PHP app. Um, and then we need to get the tracer. And the tracer is basically um, the object um, that records like all the spans under the hood. Um, and with the tracer, we can then start uh, more spans. Well, with the span builder, but you get it. Um, in order to build like these um, parent-child relationships, um, we need the current parent, um, which we can just call with a static function. Um, then we need to make the parent scope active so that the SDK knows, okay, this is now the parent. And then the next span we start will be a direct child of it. Um, so then we can give it like some name. I just call it display that, um, because that fits the function name we are currently in. Um, yeah, then we run our, um, our controller method. And in the end, we just end the span. Yeah, so and this under the hood will just set some timestamps and then we have a duration with that. So let's quickly. Oh, okay. I, I didn't detach detach the the scope. So this is also something we need to do. If you would use this like more serious in application, I mean you would probably create yourself like some wrapper functions that make that simple. Or what I like to do quite often is um you just put them in, like into a um, into a closure, like you have like some some sort of global trace method you can just uh, wrap around your code, and then it does all of that automatically. Oh dear. Hmm. That's interesting. Did I miss some imports somewhere? I don't reach the end state. Ah, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right, right. Thank you. Um, yeah, because it tries. Okay, cool. So that's why I wrapped it into finally. Makes sense. Thank you. Um, good. There we are. Cool. Um, and th then again, when you look at Jagger, we now see one trace. Um, we should actually see one with two spans. There is one. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, and now you have like your parent span and uh, your display span. So, um, and of course, the idea behind this is now that we would add many more spans to various parts of the application. Um, and we will do this now, but I will now switch to using Sentry um, <laughs> for a few reasons. Um, a, I know it much better and uh, B, the whole visualization part of Sentry just looks a little bit neater, like we have a bunch more features than Jaeger uh, offers locally. Um, but the important part is basically everything we will do, you can still apply to basically any um, observability vendor because the concept is still the same, right? Like we will hook into some certain parts of the framework, um, create our spans, uh, and this is the more important part. But like which API you use to create these spans, that, that doesn't really matter. All right, um, so let's get some stuff deleted. Okay, so let's create a new controller. And, uh, let's call it home controller.
and then as I'm lazy, let's just copy code. It's always a good idea. So let's give it some index function. And then we also probably need a template for that. Cool. And then we go to home. And we see that. Okay. Um, so when we look again at OpenTelemetry, the way how they instrumented Cake, they hooked into the invoke action of the controller. For me personally, that's already a little bit late in the whole request cycle. Like a lot of stuff has already happened. Um, the thing is, like these sorts of measurements, they are like not super precise per se, right? Like I mean. We are down to millisecond uh, precision C, which is fine. But if you look at the bigger picture, if you if you always report the same like from the same point in, in the application, like all the durations are consistent to this, right? Like the numbers might not be 100% correct, but like over time you can still see. Okay, last week it took I don't know 20 milliseconds. Now take 30, um, and that's the the more interesting part. Like like how does this data change over time? Um, but the way how I like to do it in Cake is basically um, in a middleware. Um, because like this is early enough in the request. Um, and we already have access to the request and the response object, um, which is helpful. If you want to do it like, of course, super precise, you would probably throw it into your webroot index PHP. But like most applications, there's not enough stuff there yet, right? We probably don't have access to our environment variables, like from a cake context. Um, we didn't really bootstrap the application yet. So in the end, we would probably need to work like with some super globals to access the request. And um, that's why I like to do it in the middleware, because like everything we need is already there. Um, cool. So let's bake our middleware. And I just call it Sentry Middleware. And now it's not oh, them. Now it's called Middleware Middleware. Um, good. And now we also need to load our middleware. Um, and the way we do this, we do this in our application uh, class. And I mean, I'm not sure if this is the best way or the most correct way, but like how the way I, how, uh, I like to do it, I just actually put it as the first middleware in the queue. So even before the error handler. Um, it worked so far fine, so I think that's okay. If, if someone has opinions, please tell me. <laughs> Cool. Um, and then let's have a quick look if it runs. Okay, cool. We're in there. Good. Awesome. So same with um, as with OpenTelemetry, we have to install the Sentry SDK. So let me quickly clean up here a little bit. Yeah, so for, for PHP, we actually offer uh, a few different PHP SDKs. So we have like our generic baseline SDK, which is just Sentry Sentry. Um, we also have a specific one for Laravel and comp uh, for Symfony. Um, and there are also like many um, community maintained third party SDKs. Um, and there's actually one for Cake PHP, um, which I still think is maintained by Kevin. Um, so in theory, you could just install it and be done but that wouldn't be fun. <laughs> so we will do it like more manually today. Um, but yeah, just want to let you know, 
there is an SDK for cake already. Oh, we didn't release major version 5 yet. <laughs> Next year. Good. Awesome. Um, and now we have to configure the Sentry SDK. Um, again, the way how I like to do it is in uh, my bootstrap. And I normally do this like roughly after I loaded my env uh, environment variables. So you can configure the SDK with environment variables, so we expose certain things, like setting, um, like the way how the application authenticates with Sentry. Um, you can define this via environment variables. You can configure like which, which version of the software is running on, on which environment. Um, and then you can just do that. Cool. Um, so in, in order to send data to Sentry, we need uh, a so-called DSN. So this is basically just a URL um, we use as uh, authentication. Um, and to get one of these, we create a project. Cool. Um, and that's basically what we are looking for. Cool. Yeah. So we just analyzed uh, the SDK. Um, we pass in the DSN, and then we have like certain um, rates we can configure, but uh, we will look at this a bit later. Good. Um, to ease the debugging a little bit, um, I will define a logger. And um, then we will output some log files to the logs directory. And if I'm not mistaken, there's a global constants defined, which it is. And this goes to the log directory. And then we can just omit a sentry log. Cool. And there it is. Yeah, and it's telling us a bunch of stuff. So looks like it's working. Awesome. Um, so in open telemetry, the way how open telemetry is structured, they have spans, right? Um, so the, the topmost span that wraps your whole request is called the root span, and then you can child's below that. Um, for reasons, <laughs> um, at, at Sentry, at the moment, we instead of having a root span, we have a concept we call transaction. Under the hood, it's the exact same thing. It's just a different word. Um, just want to quickly explain it, because um, the first thing we need to do now is to create a so-called transaction. Um, So there are a few things our transaction needs, um, and the most importantly is probably the name, right? Um, and to best configure, or like you, you want to find later which, which part of the application it's running, right? And um, there are a few different techniques you could use, but um, passing in the URL, it's normally a, um, a good start. Um, cool. 
Good, then we need to start our transaction uh, with the context object we created. Then um, we call our handler function. So this goes through the entire middleware stack, bootstrap your controllers, executes them, and then goes again through all the handlers, gives you the response. And at this point, we can then end the transaction. Yeah, and then we should also return the response at one point. That would be helpful. Cool. Let's have a quick look in our sentry log. So now it's selling us transactional started, but tracing is not enabled. Okay, cool. So how do we enable tracing? Um, we have like a, a configuration for that, which we call the trace assemble rate. Um, how this works is basically this represents 100%. So I want to sample all my requests that come in. Um, at a certain scale, you might be like, oh, that's a lot of data. I have uh, m maybe 50% suffices or 20% or 1% or 0.0.1%. It really depends on the scale, right? Um, because especially when it comes to telemetry, um, having some sort of it sometimes suffices instead of having everything. Though then you would need to do the math in your head. Like if you only trace like let's say 20% of your requests, all numbers you see you must need to take by five because then they're only representing a fifth of your actual traffic. Um, so if you send everything, all your metrics and all your uh, performance data of course represents true life. Cool. So now it's sending the transaction, sent the transaction, um, everything seems to be happy. Yeah, and then we can see uh, some transactions already. So um, debug kit also makes some requests, right? Like when you load it, it makes some fetch calls to your API. Um, this will be a bit noisy, um, so I'll quickly disable it just for the sake of demos. Um, no, plugins are now loaded in the plugins PHP config, <laughs> not an application anymore. Cool. So let's look at the transaction. Um, again, it shows us the duration, so in this case five milliseconds, and it shows us a bunch of metadata, um, like which browsers used based on the um, user agent header. Um, some stuff about the operating system, which PHP version runtime. Um, so this just helps you debug problems quicker. Like maybe only problem, like only people using Chrome have a bad experience on your site, but Firefox is, uh, is fine. Cool. Um, so now we have the middleware span, um, and let's make it actually a little bit more precise. So. When we call start transaction, we basically pass, um, we set the start time to the point in time right now. But your PHP request actually started a bit earlier, right? Like it started somewhere in your, somewhere around here. Um, and PHP actually uh, exposes the request start time in a super uh, in a global variable or su super global. <laughs> um, so we can actually access it. Um, So um, on the request object, there's the request time float, and that basically gives you the time the request started. Um, 
and for whatever reason, it, if it might not be set, we just use micro time, and that's what we also use under the hood. Cool. Um, yeah, and then um, again, we set the name. So as you can see right now, we use the URL, um, the raw URL. And this has a bunch of problems because like, now it says localhost, but maybe on staging it says staging dot something, and then on production it doesn't say staging. So all of them will show up differently, um, and that creates a bit of a mess. So what is actually a better technique is to not um, use the full URL, but instead like just parts of it. So uh, a good idea is like um, the request method. Like that's uh, I just like to have like a, a big get in front of it or a post. And, and then just using the path. Um, it could also be beneficial to um, set the maybe the route name as the transaction name, but as we put our middleware right at the beginning, we don't have the route name yet. But, and we can look at this later if I don't forget, we can start the transaction right now with some name, <laughs> and then later we can update it. So after the routing middleware has ran, um, we can actually get the route name and set an even better transaction name. Cool. Um, in order to classify your spans, like wh what kind of data they represent, you can also set a so-called op. Uh, in our case, it's HTTP.server. So this basically just represents an HTTP server span. Um, and later we will create different spans, so like for HTTP clients and, and database queries. Um, and you will give them uh, different ops. And once again, then you can just see like a breakdown of, okay, where does my application spend the most time? It most likely the DB. It's always the DB. Cool. Um, another thing I quickly want to touch on is the concept of distributed tracing. Um, so right now we're only tracing like one application, but in the real world, how applications work is there might be some sort of front end, like a mobile app or like some JavaScript front end. Um, that makes a request to the backend, then your backend gets the request, and then it calls 10 different microservices left and right to fetch some data. Um, and it's kind of neat to paint like the whole picture, um, like from app A to app B. And in order to do this, um, like, like most of these um, APM um, SDKs or, or uh, systems, they have some sorts of trace propagation. So basically, two systems talking via um, some sort of API um, to, to link them together. And um, in the case of Sentry, we have a so-called tracing header, the Sentry trace header. Um, and this is like a vessel that um, con uh, like, like it submits a trace ID. And the trace ID is then like stays the same over through like the whole request cycle for like f f uh, between the, all the different services. Um, and we basically want to listen to it or we want to use it. So if our, in, in any case, like if our app uh, receives a request from a front end, um, we then can continue the trace. So in this case, we get both of these headers and then um, we create a transaction context with these headers. Cool. So let's run this again. So as you can see now, our transaction name now has changed. So instead of the raw URL, we now have the HTTP method, and then we have the path. So now we can go in there again. And I mean, these numbers will fluctuate a lot, obviously, right? Um, but now it's a bit more precise, because instead of taking the point in time of the middleware, we actually take the request time from the beginning. Cool. So let's add a few more spans. Um, and something I like to do is to create a span that represents my bootstrap time. And to measure this very precisely, we can just put it in here. 
and then basically from the point in time from like the code executed in index PHP to reaching our middleware, that's roughly like like autoloading, bootstrapping the application. So we can also measure that. Because I mean, maybe you install some composer dependency that does some funky stuff. And this will add, of course, time to your application. So with a span that wraps like this um, kind of events, that, that might be beneficial. Um, cool. So I define some uh, constants here. So let's just call it cake start. Naming is hard. So we started our transaction, and now we want to start a child span of this transaction. And the way we do this is we start a child. Good. So for that, we need a span. And let's make a span. So again, it needs some sort of operation. Um, and I just call this uh, bootstrap. Then we give it a description. Hmm. What do we call it? I don't know. And then we can set the start timestamp. And again, here we defined um, the constant, so we can just use it. Then we start it, and we can immediately end it. Finish it. Um, so here, like, we don't need to measure some block of code that is executed. We basically just tell, hey, here it started, and then it ended. Um, so let's have a look how this looks. Awesome. So now we have our app bootstrap span. And now we can have a rough idea how long it takes from your index PHP to roundabout hitting your middleware. Again, we could make this a bit more precise. But um, I think it's good enough for now. Cool. So let's look at the database. Because like the requests are fine now, right? Like the, uh, the data is flowing in. We get, we get a rough idea how long um, various routes take. And the cool thing is now, and uh, just want to uh, reiterate on this, um, like these kind of features I'm showing you in Sentry are also available in a lot of other tools. Um, so like m most of these APM tools, they have like similar functionality. Um, the cool thing is with uh, the performance data we're sending in, we are now creating aggregates. So for example, you already have your percentiles because like most of the time you don't really care about the stuff that is fast. You care more about the outliers. And like in our case, like the P95 percentile, like the slowest 5% of requests are like around 21 milliseconds, which by the way is super fast. Like this doesn't need optimization. This is peak engineering. Like if all your requests are fast, you're good. <laughs> um, yeah, but again, like I would say like most of us, the bottleneck is the database. Um, because if the bottleneck is not a database anymore, you are also once again in a brilliant position that you have thousands, uh, millions of users, um, and you are no, that, that's a good problem to have. But yeah, like <laughs> for us mortals, it's mostly the database. So um, let's measure how long it takes um, to create, like to run our queries. Um, and I actually would do a quick break now, 10 minutes, and then we look into the, the database bands. Awesome. Um, so I forgot to mention a few things. Uh, number one, uh, if you have questions, please interrupt anytime. Don't be shy. Um, and something really important, I mean, again, 
Sentry is just one example of many, but I just want to reiterate um, Sentry you can actually run for free on your own infrastructure. So we offer like the exact same product experience you have, like with no features not being available to you. Um, and it's also, it's not really open source. If I say it's open source, people will yell at me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a very open license we are using. Um, so you can run it on your infrastructure, you can do whatever, the you, whatever you want with the, to do with it. The only thing you can't do is you can't host it and sell it to other people. So for that, we actually have our own license, a functional software license. But um, yeah. Um, also, if you don't want to set it up on your service, uh, we also have a free account um, where you don't have to pay and you get like some stuff to play around with. Cool. Um, there was a question on Slack I quickly want to answer. Um, so the question is, is it possible to re define both start and end time, for example, right around uh, include vendor autoload PHP? So um, basically here. And then in the middle, we use both uh, defined times, which would give a more precise time, question mark. The end of finish is not precise, question mark. Um, so Yes, absolutely. So what we could do instead is um, we could do something like this here. And then let's say uh, cake auto load start, cake uh, auto load end. And then in our middleware, um, we would basically say like, so we would set the um, the autoload start, and then we can also already define the end timestamp. And now it would actually only measure the time, sorry, uh, the time it takes to do the autoload. So what finish does under the hood, again, PHP is great, you can just look at the source, love it. Um, <laughs> it just calls micro time, right? Um, so we can do it like this, and you can also pass in the timestamp to finish directly. Um, so yeah, that's that's definitely possible to make it even more precise. So I think what would be even better, we have like a bootstrap span, and then we create yet another span just for the autoload part, right? I mean, you can go crazy. Like, <laughs> I think we have, uh, what's our span limit? I think you can send one thousand spans. So that's a lot. Um, <laughs> just keep in mind, we, you have to keep this in memory. So. <laughs> Um, cool. So let's quickly check everything is still working. Awesome. Okay. So now we want to trace our database um, queries. And for that, we need a database. And some live hack, I always have a database called my app because that's the default. And then I have a user called my app with the password of secret, which is amazing because then you don't need to change anything. It just works. <laughs> Don't do this on prod, though. Awesome, cool. Um, let's create a table. Um, let's call it users. Why not? Um, let's give it a name. Uh, yeah. And our timestamps. It's a timestamp, right? Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Um, then let's bake our model. Looking good. And then let's add some data or some user. Good. And let's add a second one. Cool. And then in our controller, is it load model? It is load model, right? No. 
table? Fetch, okay. They changed it so much. <laughs> <laughs> For a while, because I was stubborn. Because, like, <laughs> I'm, maybe I'm old school, but I'm a big fan of having functions that are protected with an underscore and functions <laughs> that are private with two underscores. Um, and I also always liked having like this users. So for a while I had my own trait, I injected all over the application. It's awesome and it works. And I mean, there are probably a lot of good reasons not to do it, but I still did it because it just worked. I, I, I liked it. Um, cool. So then let's uh, fetch the user. There it is. Hi, Mark. <laughs> I don't have faker, sorry. <laughs> um, cool. So, how do we tell, or how do we know which queries are running? Um, so, there's a query logger um, we can misuse <laughs> for that. Um, Somewhere in here, I think it's called database. No. Yeah, anyway, okay, cool. Um, so if you don't know, there's a query logger in Cake. Um, uh, when you turn it on, it writes all your queries into, the, uh, into a log file. Um, and what we will do is basically we create our own query logger, tell Cake to use it, um, and then we just intercept the data, turn it into a span, send it to Sentry. Or to the APN vendor of your choice. <laughs> um, So let's create a new folder. And then we could sentry logger PHP. Awesome. Good. Um, I will quickly copy a bunch of code and then I walk you through it because I think it's much more exciting um, than seeing me type for a few minutes. Um, Like when I, when I, um, so this is like now like using some sort of decorator of the abstract logger, right, or extending it. Um, I kind of like to keep my file structure like similar to the core. Again, this is just personal preference. Um, the reason why I'm doing this then I have, don't have to think how to name things. So someone already did this for me and then I just copy it. Um, so we extend the abstract logger. Um, and then we have a log function. And in the log function, um, we will get like the, the context. And the context holds a bunch of information. Uh, let's look at this in a second. Um, now we have to tell Cake, hey, use this query logger. Um, and the way you do this is um, you set it on the connection. So once again, in our middleware, you can also do this somewhere else. Let's just um, do it in here. Yeah, so we get the default connection because right now we only have this one. Of course, if you have more you would probably need to call this multiple times. And then we set the logger. Um, cool. And then let's actually see what this context variable holds. What did I forget? 
Ah, yeah, well, it would help to call a function. <laughs> um, yeah, let's... Do I need to do something else? Maybe. Let's see. No. Activating the query logic. That's what it was saying. Yeah, but I thought that's all there was to it. Okay. Maybe it's a bug or something. Sorry? Yeah. yeah. Um Okay. Ah, it's in the data source, right? Yeah, and then, but here's, here's false. Um. Hmm. Yes, well, <laughs> the little things. Okay, cool. I, I think we don't need to turn it on. Okay, good, cool. The beauty of live coding. So here we have our log query. Um, that's the query. Um, the parameters and also how long it took. So I think that's a milliseconds, so one milliseconds. Um, that's, of course, not super 100% precise, but once again, if your queries take one millisecond, you're in a su superb place to be. <laughs> um, cool. The good thing is that this query is actually parameterized, right? So instead of saying one here, it uh, has a placeholder. And once again, this is good for aggregation later on, because you, you run a lot of queries, obviously, um, and what you want to look at is like the, how long do they take on average? And if every query would have like various, uh, par like, like if it would actually be the raw query, then you would have a query that has like user ID one, user ID two, and so on and so forth. So you can't aggregate them. So having access to the actually the parameterized query is awesome for uh, observability. So that's good. Cool. So what does our query logger actually do? So it fetches the parent span. Um, it takes the query context. Um, then it sets, like it creates a span and sets some metadata. Um, so in our case, I think this is MySQL. The description of the span, this is uh, like our parameterized query. Um, and then we set uh, once again the start and stop timestamps. And then we, we start it. Um, what, I, what I'm also doing here is, in case you run transactions, I, I wrap them as a, as a parent span. So you have, like, once again, you have a span that would then say, like, um, like transactions begin, then you would see all your queries, and then you would have a, a commit span. So once again, this is just for data, like how, how the data is represented in the trace view. Um, just looks a bit nicer. Okay, and... Um, this step is optional, but I mean, in, in PHP, we are pretty sure that nothing else happens <laughs> while we run our query, right? I mean, it's kind of unlikely, but just in case we are pushing our current span uh, to an array, so just that we, we keep some reference. In theory, we could just start and end it, but then we would basically rely on that no other span is created in, at the same time. Good. Cool. So one thing that is still missing is we need to set the current span. Because like uh, in our middleware here, we start a transaction, we start a span, and like all of them are like in the scope of the function. <coughs> but as the other span gets created in the query logger, we still need to set like the current span uh, to the active one. So let's quickly do this.
So we just set the current span. Um, and then again, in our query logger, we then get this span we just set there, and then we can continue here. So let's quickly see if we have the span. We don't. Why? Ah, yes, okay. We are setting our query logger too early. So let's set the span and then let's set up the query logger. Awesome. Good. So, yeah, that's from right now. Okay, so um, so in our home controller, we, we execute a query, right? Why is there no parent span? Sorry? Ah, th thank you, Mark. <laughs> um, yeah, so we set it. Yeah, let's actually finish the span here. Awesome, okay, cool. So now we have a parent span, very good. Um, and then we hit this endpoint a few times. Twenty-eight, that looks good. And now we have a database query in Sentry. Awesome, cool. Um, so uh, I, during the break I was asked like, okay, and what I'm doing with that? Well, you are unlikely to look at all of your traces and uh, try to find like what's the slowest query. Um, and for that, we basically aggregate certain kinds of spans into aggregated views. Um, so in here, we have like a queries module. Um, so this t might take a while to show up here. But um, in here now, you would basically see all the queries that are running. Then you can just fill it by the slowest. And then you can take it from there, right? So you see which query is executed. You could, like on your uh, database, you can run an explain query. Maybe you're missing an index. Yes, you always miss an index. <laughs> and then again, over time, you can actually see like um, what's what are the differences. Like you you deploy a new version, and you see like okay, now my query is ten times slower. Hmm. Um, so yeah, that's for what this is helpful. Cool. So now we have uh, query logging. Actually, let me take a quick look because I, 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 I feel like I forgot something because it should show up there. Um. Oh, okay. It, it just took some time. <laughs> okay, cool. So, so now here we have the query. Um, actually, let me spam the endpoint a little bit more. Um, so yeah, the system will now tell you like in which endpoints the query is called. So again, I mean, right now we just have this run ro home route, but like in a real application, obviously you would see like all your endpoints that's called a query. Um, gives you the average duration and it also gives you some exemplars you can look at. And then again, like it always calculates like some sort of um, offset, like this one is slower, this one is faster than the average. And this data gets much more useful, much more useful after a while, right? Like you, you deploy it on production, then a week later you can already see how it's developing. Um, 
there's also some convenience features. Like if you want, you could also tell us like where do you execute a query. This makes debugging a little bit easier. You can basically get the uh, like the the call stack, and then you can see where you executed your query from. Cool. So um, this is already really good, right? We we can measure our overall request time, so we will we know which endpoints are slow, or not which are slow, but like how long they take. Um, and we have query logging. So this is like for most applications as a start, it's more than enough. You already have so much more insight now, um, how your database is doing or like the queries that are running on it, um, how your application is doing. Um, but we, of course we can, we can do more. <laughs> so let's do more. Um, Something that is important when it comes to tracing, you don't need to wrap every function in, in, in a span. This is a bit excessive, right? Um, but so I would rather focus on important pieces of the application. So maybe you call some third party API um, and, then you, and then you want to know how fast slash slow the API calls are. Um, so let's do this. Let's, so when basically when we use the uh, cake uh, HTTP client, um, every time we do so, we want to create um, a spam. So Cake has will soon have uh, events in the um, HTTP client, um, but as 5.1 is not released just yet, um, we quickly have to switch to it. And I think the latest one is RC1. Okay, yeah, right. Defa, okay. Cool. Good. Um. Yeah. Good idea. Uh, S5.0. Good. <coughs> Successfully tricked the system. <laughs> Cool. Um, let's call some API. So let's get the client. And then let's make a request. So if you're still using Cake 4, uh, sorry, Cake 5 or before, um, the way how you could do this today is basically you create a subclass of the client um, and then you just overwrite a method. Um, send a request comes to mind and then you would basically start the span, call send request in the client, finish the span. Um, but again with uh, 5.1, we now have an e event for that. Um, so in here, yeah. So now uh, on the, clo so we can like uh, set up a global event listener and it, it dispatches an event in before send, which is awesome because then we can start the spam and it dispatches an event after the request and then we can finish the spam. Um, and Not everyone likes these events, <laughs> but uh, I really like them because um, it makes it really, really easy to hook into the framework when it's doing certain things. Um, so let's let's do this. Um, again, there are probably a lot of different ways how we could do this, um, but I will just do it in here. Good. So how do we listen to an event? Like this. 
So we get the global event manager and then so first we want before send and then we want after send I think it's called yes awesome and then we need to execute some callback or call some callback um, and let's just call this client and here we will do the same and I think this has access to the event and then we just pass this on. Cool. So let's have a look what's in there. So here we have the before send, and then we have a um, bunch of stuff attached to it. And most importantly, we have the request object. Cool. So let's start our span with that. So um, once again, we have to check that we actually have a parent span flying around. Um, we actually need two different callbacks, one to start, one to finish. So the reason we have to put like these um, guardrails uh, in there is um, sometimes we, like if you set your sample rate something to lower than one, sometimes you don't even have a span, right? Um, and then we can just bail early. Like this is more a bit of a performance optimization because you, you can still create all these spans, but if you already know that this span or the span tree will never be sent, then why bother creating them in the first place? Good, so for the op, we call it HTTP client. Once again, this will be helpful for giving a breakdown where our application is spending time in, and then we set some description. Um, good, so a string, like for description, we need the URL. Um, and in this case, you actually want the entire URL. Um, keep in mind, though, that if you attach like your API tokens as a get parameter, then it will show up in Sentry. So maybe don't do this. <laughs> um, but yeah, f for now, we will um, just use the entire URL, URI, uh, no, request get URI. Good. And then it also wants us to um, attach a bit more, also like optionally. Um, so like instead of setting the query parameters like on the URL, we could like just attach it as spend data. Um, that makes it easier for us on the server to scrub this kind of data, right? Like th there are a lot of mechanisms in the SDK to actually do this um, yourself. Like we have some hooks like before send and we can actually go into the data that will be transmitted and unset certain things. Um, but we also have some scrubbing on the server um, and it makes our life much easier than having to run some very inefficient regexes on a string that when you actually have like data that is predefined like HTTP query, we can just run our scrubbers on that. Um, yeah, cool. So we start our span. And 
then once again oh wait so event get data yes cool and then once again we set our span as active good and on on end we just have to finish the span if it exists awesome so now the request takes obviously a bit longer right because we're making a call to um, example.com And there it is. Cool. So now we know that this request took 400 milliseconds, which is actually pretty damn slow. But you get the idea, right? Like um, I run some uh, applications um, that talk a lot with the Slack API, and it's always the Slack API. <laughs> um, and that re really helps you. like, um, Because, I mean, it's... it's doesn't need to be like a third-party API. You can also call your own services. It once again, it just gives you a really good insights onto like where your application is spending time on. Um, so let's uh, enhance the experience even more, um, because we can also like track how long certain, um, sorry, like like how what what response codes you normally get, right? Like maybe you get redirects, maybe you get four fours, five hundreds, whatever. Um, and to do that, we basically just have to attach a little bit more data to the span. Um, so when we want a response, um, we can get the result of the event. So when we look at this. Yeah, so this is our response object. So we have the response code um, and a bunch of other stuff, like the headers and so on and so forth. But for now, we only care about the response code. Good. And then before we finish the span, we can basically set some additional data onto it. And the, the keys we actually use for, for most of these um, stuff, th they're actually from OTEL. So OTEL has like semantic conventions, which change all the time, which is also a bit sad. <laughs> but yeah, this, this is just like something the industry agreed on how to call certain things. Um, so we, we follow that. And so we have the result. And if I'm not mistaken, there is a get status code. Let's see. Okay, doesn't yell at us. That's good. Cool. What else could we set? Um, yeah, maybe the request method. Why not? So that we could already do here if we'd like. Um, Then I think there is a get method there. Oh. Um.
unknown domain. That's not good. What are we missing? Ah, the server address. Okay. <coughs> but once again, you will have a rundown of all your APIs you're calling, average duration, error rate, response codes. Once again, you can look for outliers. We get your examples. You can drill in. Awesome. Cool. Um, there are other events you could listen to. Um, Cake has actually a bunch. So we could basically just look through the core. So you could create spans uh, when you render a view. You can wrap your commands in, in spans. I mean, it also helps, like just tracing your commands on the command line. It works the exact same way. Um, there are all the control events. So yeah, basically, you just extend your event listener, and then you can build your spans without the need to um, extend a lot of um, stuff from Cake in your own app and use that instead. So this is really powerful. Um, yeah, and the sky's the limit. I mean, you know best what is important in your application, um, and then you can just incrementally build stuff. Cool. So that would be the tracing part. Um, next, uh, I quickly want to show you how uh, you would like report exceptions to a third-party service, um, which is even more important than tracing. So, so do the uh, exception thing first and then do the tracing later. Um, so software fails. We all make mistakes. <laughs> and um, it helps the business a lot if you know about them, right? And once again, you can do various techniques to do this. Once again, the easiest is probably just look into your log files. Um, there are tons of services that also do like aggregation for log files. But these errors, they lack a lot of stuff most of the time. Like, like, like logs are pretty dumb. Um, so you're, for example, you miss which user, uh, you miss like all the request context. Like, like there's just a lot of stuff you don't have in logs. So um, logging your exceptions to some third party service with an enhanced context really helps a lot. Um, the way you would do this in Cake um, is basically um, you can define your own uh, error logger. So um, to do this, you would basically, in our app PHP, there is somewhere, yeah. So you can define your own logger. So let's quickly do this. Um, and then we also need the error logger. Once again, I just copy the code and then I walk you through what it actually does. So I think this is, yeah, let's put it into error. Once again, somehow following the structure that Cake has to not have to think about it too much. Good. So we're extending Cake's error logger and use it. Um, and the two things we, we care about is basically log error and log exception. And um, for log error, um, in this case, once again, I'm using the Sentry SDK, but just replace it with whatever you would like to use. Um, we capture a message because it's just an error. Um, and if we have an exception, we capture the exception. Um, we, like this is very Sentry specific, but we have like a feature to mark an exception as handled. So think about you do like something in a try catch block, but you still want to report exception, but you handled it. Yeah. So in, in order to have like a small distinction in the UI, uh, which I'll show you in a second, um, I'm basically marking everything that goes in here as non handled, because if this uh, error handler of cake handles it, it's, yeah, well, that's, <laughs> that's normally bad. Um, but if you handle it, um, you don't have to mark it as this. Cool. Um, so let's 
created an exception. So it also reports deprecations. Um, you can turn this off. <laughs> um, so basically in Cake, um, I think it's something like this. So basically everything besides deprecations, if I'm not mistaken. S sorry? Oh yeah, okay. But yeah. Um, so here's our exception. Um, this is the handled unhandled thingy I told you, like it has a small skull there, making it look more severe. So what do you get here actually? Um, you get the stack trace. How handy, right? Um, we of course show you preferably like your own frames, um, but you have actually like the full stack trace, like right from index PHP uh, up. And as you can see, we also capture the um, function arguments. Um, this is not enabled by default in PHP anymore. Since 7.4, there's like an indirective called Zend ignore exception args, which is on by default. Um, so if you uh, turn this off, then uh, exception like the, the stack traces PHP um, generates, they have the exception args. Um, this could contain sensitive data, yes, but it's super crucial for debugging, right? Like uh, you kind of want as much as information as possible. Um, but yeah, it's always a trade-off. So we have the full stack trace, awesome. We have the request headers, also awesome, right? Like once again, we know which browser, um, certain cookies, whatever you can think of. Um, and we group this together for you. So. To explain it simply, basically every error that has a similar stack trace gets grouped together, and then we give you like how many times this happened, um, which is helpful because if an exception happened once, but an, another one 500 times, you probably focus more on the one that happens 500 times. Um, you might be wondering, hey, why does this one show up on court error? So the SDK by default also registers its own error handler. Um, so the second you call sentry init, um, in our uh, case here, we do this in the bootstrap. Basically from here on on, all errors will be um, catched and at one point then Cake basically takes over the error handler um, and that's why we hooked into it. So once again, you want to do this as soon as possible into your app. Once again, index PHP would be best, but again, doesn't always work that way. Um, so but that's fine. I mean, the likelihood that something breaks before that you ho hopefully catch this somewhere else. Fingers crossed. <laughs> um, and we also tell you how many users are affected, but um, we, we have to tell Sentry that, uh, that there is a user. So how we would do this, um, I'm, I'm not gonna set up the whole authentication um, stack now because again I think that <laughs> that would be boring but um, you basically run your authentication um, middleware and then after you can once again create a new middleware and would attach the user I can actually show you this real quick how this roughly looks like so in my so in this application um, I have a sentry user middleware and what it does is basically it gets the um, identity attribute from the request and then it sets it on the so-called scope. So th the scope is a vessel to mark like a, some, like it, it wraps like an execution context. Um, this is, once again, this concept is not really needed in PHP because of the lack of concurrency. So it would make sense if you run something like Roadrunner, Swool, whatever, um, but yeah. So we attach the user to the scope 
and then from this moment on, every error that happens will have the user attached. And then in your uh, error reporting tool, you can also see like how many users are affected. Once again, that then really helps um, to prioritize or to triage the issue. Um, and it can also tell you um, like which user maybe you can reach out. Awesome. Um, so that is error reporting in a nutshell. Once again, in Cake, it's pretty straightforward. Sentry error logger, set it in your app PHP, and then you're good to go. Cool. Um, let's see. Okay, so you can choose now. <laughs> Are you more interested in metrics or interested in profiling? <laughs> okay, then let's do profiling. Um, shall we do a quick break again? 10 minutes? Or? Okay, then. Yeah, let's continue for a while and then maybe a quick break again. Okay, so what is profiling? Um, with the tracing we've done, we we can measure like certain things that are important to us, but as I mentioned before, it's not practical at all to um, to measure like every single function and wrap it into a span. This creates overhead. This is too much data, and it's just not useful. But sometimes it's useful to know how long your functions run, and for that, profiling comes in really handy. So. Maybe mo some of you already use something like Xdebug, right? So Xdebug, um, which you can like use locally, um, it records every function that is called, gives you a call stack, um, and then you can really like look for performance problems. Like maybe you have some iterator that goes crazy or something like that. But um, the big problem with um, deterministic profilers, as they are called, th they have a ton of overhead, right? Because on every, like how, the way how most profilers in PHP work is that in the Zend engine, you basically have a hook that uh, is called on every function invocation. And then the profiler basically records. Um, and this takes a bit of time, a little bit. But when you use a framework, and maybe you just saw stack trace, you call quite a few functions. <laughs> and if you then record, like for every function, you um, uh, re record the, the, the frame. Um, this adds a lot of overhead. So if you do this in production, that just kills your system. Like your response times will be through the roof. So it's a really bad idea to do this. Um, some, like the different techniques, like some services, what they do, they do like um, synthetic profiling, they call it. So they call your app endpoints you want to profile, and then only this request gets profiled in its entirety. Um, so you s it's still, production, um, but it only shows you like a really small subset of your overall request. Um, a much better solution to this problem is, is uh, using a sampling profiler. So what is a sampling profiler? So a sampling profiler, instead of um, recording every function, um, it records the stack. So basically what's happening at a given time and moment every 10 milliseconds, for example. Like th that's that's a, good, um, a good starting point. And when you only do this every 10 milliseconds, the overhead is negligible. Sure, there's always overhead, right? Um, but if you only do it every 10 milliseconds, um, it gives you a rough idea what's happening in the application. And 10 milliseconds is also like fast enough, right? Um, so it's the best of both worlds. You get enough insights, but you also don't tank your performance too much. Um, and there are a few prof uh, profilers out there um, and the one uh, I chose at Sentry uh, is from Wikipedia. So uh, it's called Excimer. Um, that's the sampling profile that they, they wrote a while ago. Um, it works from PHP 7.1 and up. Um, and that's what our SDK uses. So uh, let's set it up. We need an extension for that, <laughs> of course. Um, so uh, the extension is called Excimer. You would just install it via Peckle. And if I'm not mistaken, I already did this. Um, so let's have a look at my PHP in here. So here's the Excimer. 
Good. And um, <coughs> so now we have to tell the SDK to uh, profile. And once again, you can decide how many of your requests you want to profile. So right now we would do 100%, but again, you could tweak this. Though this is relative to the trace assembly rate, actually, because technical reasons, right now we need a transaction to send a profile. Um, this is more of a U UX feature or concern because you, you kind of want some grouping in your profiles, right? Because if you just look at random profiling data without any context, that's a bit rough. I mean, again, in PHP, that's kind of solved because the request is like really isolated most of the time. But yeah. Good. Um, so let's open our log again and we can start profiling. Uh, before we do that, let's remove the exception we are throwing. Good. Good, uh, it's uh, profiled. Okay, so in theory, we should see some profiles at one point. Yes, okay. So, um, this is a flame chart. <laughs> so, this shows you like um, your call stack. But this is just one exemplar, right? Like this is one transaction. This is one um, one profile, and it basically starts right at the top in XPHP, and then it goes down to whatever's happening. So there are a few downsides with sampling profilers and in combination with PHP. So um, whenever there is like some native code running, and with native code I mean like an HTTP client because like under the hood it probably uses curl and this is written in C. Um, or if you make a database query which uses PDO probably, um, and then this is also written in C, this code is not profiled. Um, because once again the send engine only calls the callback if there's a user line function called, and in our case it doesn't. So the problem we are seeing here is because we only have like one frame, right? Um, and this is basically to do due to the fact that we start profiling and this 10 millisecond sample rate is not really precise in PHP because we can only evaluate it if we call a function. So if we miss the 10 millisecond mark, it gets a little bit skewed. Yeah? And then if we do like some, um, some HTTP client calls or database queries, once again, no user code function is uh, ran. Um, so once again, we can't take a snapshot of the DOM. But the important part is this might look super useless to you, uh, and I agree, but it's much more important to look once again at the aggregate data. So you collect profiles, and then we can do nifty things with it, because over time you will get enough good profiles that we can start to look at how long certain function calls are taking, right? And then we can actually tell you stuff like, oh, this regressed. So to give you one real life example, um, I'm running a cake app at, uh, at a Sentry, and I was upgrading it to Cake 5. Um, worked very well, just used Rector, um, was done in a few minutes actually. <laughs> um, but then um, after a few days, I, I looked at some profiles, um, and I saw that like my, my API pins, like I, I saw that my API endpoints got really, really slow. Like before they were like, I don't know, 100 milliseconds, and all of a the sudden they were like 500 milliseconds. Um, and I didn't really know wh why, because, um, I mean, I didn't make any changes besides upgrading cake. So uh, what I then uh, figured out in, with profiling was that um, there was just simply a bug in, in cake that um, when you created like a, a daytime object, they didn't, um, I think we, did, we just didn't cache the Intel formatter correctly. Mark, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, <laughs> and yeah, and I saw it right here. Um, and that was really, really helpful. Um, to, to pinpoint uh, my, my performance problems uh, really quickly. Um, this also won't help you if all your requests are 20 milliseconds, obviously, right? Um, because once again, they're fast enough, but it, it really helps like when you, when you have a big app with a lot of functions, 
over time you will get really, really good insights into how your function actually uh, performing versus just your entire request. Um, yeah, cool, good. I, I, I realized that like uh, all of this empty stuff I showed you um, doesn't really <laughs> convey um, the, the whole story. So let's actually look at a real a live cake app running on prod um, producing telemetry data um, and actually show you like how profiling um, looks there when, when we have a, a bit more data. Um, so this is my uh, cake app I run at Sentry um, and I also using profiling um, and this here would be like one example of the um, of a request function. So uh, July 17th, uh, I added a new feature to the system and user table initialize suddenly got a lot slower, right? Like on average it was at 52 milliseconds and now all of a sudden it takes 250 milliseconds. Um, so what, what, what happened? Um, once again, we can look at an exemplar. Um, so this is already much more useful than just having like a very short flame graph. Um, and we, so, so here's the um, users table. Um, so a bit more context, this is a command I'm running uh, on the CLI. Uh, so it's a cron job that runs every hour. Um, and the way this application is hosted, it runs on GCP Cloud Run, so on the Google Cloud. And Cloud Run is basically like a Docker execution environment um, because then you don't need servers. It's amazing. It's probably super expensive, but I'm not paying it, so um, <laughs> very convenient. Um, so every hour, uh, GCP Cloud Run spawns a new Docker container, executes the cron job, and then it goes away. So um, I was looking at this and was like, how can table initialize all of a sudden takes so long? But if you actually look what it's doing, and we can zoom in here, it gets the schema of the table. And if you see something like this in production, you're like, no, it shouldn't do that. It should use the cached schema. But there is no cached schema. Why is there no cached schema? Well, the Docker container is recreated every hour. Um, and well, the first time um, the ORM fetches or executes a query, it, it needs to fetch the schema. Um, so how can I fix this? Well, I won't fix it because I could create the schema basically during the deploy, but that would take as long as just running it once. And as this is like a command that runs in the background, I don't care about it. Um, but still, it's like super useful um, to, to have this information at, at my disposal. Um, so I hope that makes it a bit clear why I'm such a strong believer in profiling because like these kind of issues you can't detect in any other way. Um, you, of course, I mean, you could probably get close locally, but locally is not production, right? So actually measuring your prod code is, makes much more sense. Um, and, and with that, um, it, it helps a lot. And it, I mean, it's also kind of easy to set up, right? You don't have to clutter your code with all the spans and stuff like that. You ch just have to install an extension. Um, so yeah, that would be one example of that. Um, and what's also kind of neat is, so I, I, I said like, we looked at an exemplar, so like one request, but um, what's, when it comes to sampling profiling, what's much more useful to look at is actually the so-called flame graph. So the flame graph is actually an aggregation of all profiles data in a certain time frame, like in my case, a month, um, because here you can actually see like, where does my application spend most of its time? and yeah, it's all the cron jobs <laughs> or all the command line arguments. Um, so in this case, I don't care um, that much, but again, just apply this like to your application um, and it might look a little bit different. Um, also see like other slowest application functions, like not in the framework, but like um, in, in, in the app, like, like everything blue here is in app, um, everything red um, is a third party. And then it just shows you like, where, where you spend like most of the time. So for example, get applicable time zones takes very long um, because it's terrible code. <laughs> <laughs> I was already expecting it to be slow um, and now it is. Now I have proof. Um, 
I won't fix it either. Once again, it's a cron shop. If it runs two minutes, it runs two minutes. If it runs five minutes, it runs five minutes. This is a really small system, um, so it's fine, but it's, it, it's just good to know, right? Um, yeah, so uh, profiles here, that's awesome. Um, we, can, we can also once again look at queries, right? So um, just with having uh, much more data to our exposal. So these are like all the queries that are running in the application. Um, and yeah, I can see like which query runs a lot. So maybe this gives me some ideas for optimization. Um, also tells me like the average duration. Um, and when I look at this, my slowest query takes 37 milliseconds. That's really good. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, that's actually the, the, the most complex query I have in the system, um, which does a lot of joining and stuff. And this query was terrible slow. Like in the beginning, it took like, I don't know, three, 400 milliseconds. So already optimized this. Super helpful, yeah. Um, once again, same with requests. I mean, I told you before, like I'm calling Slack a bunch of times. So here you can see this. Um, yeah, so that's the kind of insights you get if you like just produce a lot of telemetry data. Um, yeah, cool. So, um, how do we actually send this data to Sentry? Well, we um, make a curl request. So uh, the SDK doesn't use Guzzle or anything. Um, I, we have like our own curl client. Um, so in order to run the SDK, you need uh, ex the curl extension, but this basically comes by default nowadays anyways. Um, but it's a blocking request. So when you send your tracing data to Sentry, it takes a while. I don't know. I mean, it really depends where you are in the world, where your service hosted and so on and so forth. But just to have a ballpark, let's say the request to Sentry round trip takes 200 milliseconds. Um, and you really don't want to let your users wait for 200 milliseconds just because you <laughs> sent your performance data. Um, so what are the options? Uh, in the beginning, I mentioned uh, OTIL has the concept of a so-called collector, um, and Sentry has something similar, um, which we call Relay. So Relay is our ingestion proxy. Um, this is basically the first piece of infrastructure you hit when you send data to Sentry, and we host them all around the world. Um, uh, but it's also open source, asterisk. Um, <laughs> and you can, you can host it next to your application. Again, the round trip time will be much shorter, um, and your performance will be greatly improved. But that's not good enough. So um, something uh, I had on my wish list in Cake, and I think Atmat implemented it. I'm, I'm very grateful he did it. Um, when you're using FPM, and I hope everyone does, um, there is actually uh, a method you can use um, that flushes the response to the user, but the PHP process continues. So your client already got the response, but you can still do stuff later on, which is awesome. Because sure, I mean, it still takes time, but this time doesn't affect the client. So it's great. Um, and yeah, so there's once again an event, um, and uh, I can quickly show you how you can use it. Um, so it's this one. Okay, so here we call transaction finish. Um, and again, this will create an HTTP call and this is blocking, right? Um, and there's not really a way around this. Um, you could use a shutdown handler, but then again, this might get tricky on like um, serverless runtimes, like, like lambdas. I don't know if PG actually runs on lambda, but yeah, uh, you get the idea. Like sometimes the container just dies and <laughs> because it doesn't wait until the shutdown handler uh, finished. So uh, using this event um, is a much better approach. Um, and that's how you would use it. Yeah, so it's called server terminate. And then again, we have a callback we can use and then we call transaction finish. So let's actually look how this is implemented in Cake. Yeah, so we have the response emitter and it emits something. Yeah, and this is th the magic. <laughs> so
So fast CGI finish request. So this tells Nginx, hey, flush the response to the client, but still the PHP process continue. So you can, so if you, if you want to do something in the request which shouldn't affect your user's response time, you can just do it in here. And in our case now, we are flushing the transaction in the terminate event, so this doesn't affect the client anymore, which is amazing. Yeah. So for errors, you could use a similar approach, um, though, at least that's my philosophy, if there's an unhandled exception and you're showing an error page, I'd rather have the error reported and the error page loads 200 milliseconds slower than not having the error reported. But in, in theory, what you could also do, you could just collect all the errors that happens in the request and then once again uh, flush them at the end at server terminate. Has some trade-offs, for example, if you have like an out of memory um, error, by then it will be gone, right? It won't be reported. So the way how we do this in, in our SDK is we actually, when you initialize the SDK, we reserve a little bit of extra memory. So in the case there is an out of memory error, we can still send it. Um, which is really tricky, like reporting out of memory errors in PHP is tricky because you're out of memory. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so once again, different trade-offs, um, but yeah, there are some solutions, some work better, some, some doesn't. So that's the server terminate event uh, coming in Cake 5.1. Um, it's really cool. I mean, you can also like, I don't know, write chops to the queue in there, right? The user does something, makes an order, and then in server terminate, you write it to the queue. Super cool. Good. Um, let's look a little bit at metrics. Um, what are metrics? <laughs> metrics can represent different things that happen in the application. Um, when you look at like infrastructure monitoring, a good metric to record is like your CPU usage over time, right? So every X amount of time, you record the current uh, CPU load, and then you can plot a nice graph over time. Um, you can record metrics how full your disk is. You can record metrics um, about all sort of things. And um, so uh, uh, this really depends on the application, right? So. Um, whatever we want to track. So w one thing we could uh, do now in Cake is basically we could say we want to count the unique users that log into my application, right? Just for the sake of it. I mean, um, so the way uh, we could do this is um, we have to define them first. So we add a metric here. Um, oh no, okay, sad, good. So this is a new feature which isn't available yet. <laughs> <laughs> but we can use the old, uh, old stuff. Um, so let's go into our app. And let's say we want to record some metric here. Um, so we have a bunch of different metrics. Um, the simplest ones are counter, like how many times something happened. Like um, how many orders, how many requests. I mean, this we calculate for you, <laughs> how many requests. But this is also a metric. This is a counter, right? Distributions. What is a distribution? So a distribution is helpful if you want to like to see changes over time. So uh, like a distribution metric would be something like a CPU usage, right? Like you plot a graph over time that you can do with a distribution. Um, sets are helpful to have like unique um, unique entries. So uh, let's create a set metric uh, with the user. So we give it a name, um, unique users, and so once again, what you would do, you would um, do this a bit later after the authentication middleware is ran, then you fetch the uh, identity. But um, let's just uh, use my, uh, like just use a hard coded email for now. And then you can also tag your metrics. And this then basically helps you to split them up on different things, um, like 
for example, which, which browser or which region your users. And I mean, this is really up to you what you want to do, right? Like there's no, <laughs> there's no like good general recommendation for what to collect metrics. It's, it's really up for you. Um, so uh, we don't, I think, need any text right now. Good. So here we have the metrics. Um, and like how normally how the system works is you have like uh, some concurrent job in the background that is basically collecting all your metrics together and then flushing them every 10 seconds or so, like in buckets. Um, once again, we are in PHP, we can't do this easily. Um, so basically over the whole request, you collect your metrics. They are still like aggregated and bucketed, but in the end you kind of need to tell the SDK one, uh, uh, that you want to flush it. Um, so once again, it's a good idea to do this in the terminate event. Um, we have no overhead concerns there. Oh God, I imported the wrong class. Good, fixed it. <laughs> cool, so this will take a few seconds uh, until it shows up. Um, Once again, switching to the stuff that has data, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Um, so for example, here I'm collecting metrics about some stuff being handed out. Um, it's aggregated based on the, uh, on the route it, it takes. Um, and then you have like just over time, you see a graph, right? Um, something else I, um, I'm doing here is um, I record the peak memory usage of the uh, PHP uh, process. So, um, in PHP, what you can call um, yeah, so you can memory get peak usage. So um, this gives you the memory in bytes, I think. So the most amount of memory that was allocated in the current request. Um, and this just adds a nice signal once again to find like stuff that might be not performing very well. So in here, I can basically look at like um, the values. So like this request has the most amount of memory. I mean, 2.5 megabytes, it's not a lot. Um, and then we can once again look like examples exemplars, um, look at the trace, look at the profile. So metrics are a great way to detect anomalies. Like it's just some signal uh, you have to your disposal and then you can drill in with the other telemetry data you uh, collected to, to actually find issues. Um, of course, what you would do in a real world scenario is you wouldn't go in the UI and, and look for problems. You would actually like create so-called alerts, right? So when your CPU usage is about uh, above 80% in the last 10 minutes, you can send out an email or get pinged in a Slack channel. And the same goes for transactions and errors, right? Like, um, like m most of these tools out there, they have some sort of alerting and integrations into various services. And uh, that's the kind of stuff you would, you would do with this data. Awesome. Um, that's kind of it. <laughs> Do you have questions? Okay, I can I can answer a question from uh, Discord in the meantime. Uh, can we profile shell command runs? And what if that background process runs over one thousand DB queries? Then what? Um, right now, I. So right now we have a limit on our profiles, which is 30 seconds. Um, just that's how we built the product initially. 
um, which of course doesn't work really well in uh, CLI commands because they normally take longer. But uh, we are currently uh, working on something we call continuous profiling. So instead of um, being limited to 30 seconds, we will just continuously collect the stacks and then flush it. Uh, once again, this will be a bit tricky in PHP. <laughs> um, so there will probably be some uh, user, uh, some, some uh, SDK functions you have to call periodically to flush the current profiles. Um, but this is definitely coming. Cool. Any other questions? What are typical pitfalls? Oh, also. What are typical pitfalls with testing and, and, and observing code like this? Um, so, I mean, once again, this, this depends a little bit on your application, but I would say, like, on average, the most common performance issue we see are M plus one queries. So let's say you fetch um, all users, then you iterate over all users and fetch them one by one again. Um, mm -hmm. And we can actually detect this automatically and send you an alert for that. Other tools can just do this as well. So yeah, like most of the time, it's some stuff with your database. Um, so, w what is currently not available in 5.0 and the patch releases, uh, so it's the server terminate event. So, this will come with 5.1. Uh, and what's also not available is the, um, uh, is the HTTP uh, events. So, they're also in 5.1. Um, but I think that's it uh, from everything I showed. Um, I've been using 5.1 because YOLO. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, it, it's working fine. But for example, like this app, um, I, I still haven't uh, changed it to the new HTTP client events. So what I'm basically doing is I'm extending the cake HTTP client. I mean, I think I, I mentioned this before and just like do the stuff and send request. Um, so everything I showed is possible. Also, also like the, uh, the server terminate stuff is, should be possible. I mean, you probably can hack it in yourself, I think. But yeah. So I think these are the two things that will come. 